Hello guys and dolls, welcome back to Honey Badger 3D Print and Paint. Today we're at Photocentric, taking a look at how they're revolutionising mass manufacturing. But before we get started, roll those credits. Okay guys, so here we are in Photocentric's print farm. And this is one of the reasons for our visit today. So our next big project is the Ecto-1 from Ghostbusters. It's a model available on Gambody. And there are a lot of parts on this that because of the scale we wanted to do it at, which is 175% of the original scale that Gambody wants to do it, um, we couldn't fit it on any of our machines. So, we immediately rang Photocentric and they jumped into action. They got into their own little weird Batmobile and they designed this. So there were massive singular parts like this that were gonna cause us huge issues. We were originally trying to print it solid. Photocentric's engineers helped us, to, to helped us with the design and, uh, and they basically said that it's gonna be way, way more efficient to hollow this. This will have active leaf suspension. It will have TPU printed wheels, a real steering rack. The doors will open. There is the Ghostbuster proton pack that will come out the back. And there's even a chance, not a great one, I'll admit, but there is a chance that it will light up afterwards. The point of doing it this way and the point of doing this all in resin is to try and make this as studio quality, as ready for on film as we possibly can. And resin really is the only choice for that. Now the problem you have when you try and go at scale is you have shear forces, you have weight, you have supports, you have all sorts of issues, you have warpage and a bunch of other issues as well. The level of which Photocentric have the expertise in these big, big resin prints to be able to do. Now we've got the Mega 8K, but that does not come close to the size and scale of the Magna. We've got something else to show you that makes this look like an original photon it is giant what we've got coming in a moment but this is one of the main points of our visit so once this is done we are going to try and get this to a place where it has an automotive level of paint of paint finish to it so this is going to look absolutely stunning it's going to be coming to form next with us this year which is going to be one of the most stressful flights i've ever had in my entire life um but yeah Take a look at how absolutely astonishing this is. We'll do a quick pan around so you can see where this is. Bear in mind, this still needs to be joined, filled, the interior done, priming, painting, sanding, everything else involved in that as well. But we could not have done this without Photocentric. Not just because they actually make resin, so this was actually certainly affordable for us, <laughs> but, uh, but also because of the sheer size this takes up on the build plate and the expertise you require to print things this size. It's not just click and print once you start getting this big. You start having to deal with physics, you start having to deal with different geometries, different support mechanisms and all sorts. You can still see inside here, we've still got some support still on this. So when this is done, we're gonna have this, the bonnet's gonna open, all the doors will open, a really cool interior as well. One other thing that Photocentric are doing for us are the windows. Windows are so hard. You want them optically clear. These are specialized parts. Doing them in resin is not always easy. You get a cloudy effect. It goes yellow over time. So once again, we bring in the engineers, we bring in the people who know what they're doing, and we're gonna try and make this as close to studio grade as we can. But this isn't the only reason we're here. So let's check out the next bit. And now we come to one of the big reveals. 
So when you want to print something this big and this complicated, what you need is something this big and this complicated. The liquid crystal type. So I am joined by Callum, one of the engineers of this absolute beast. So Callum, why don't you give us the rundown of what this actually is? Um, so this is Liquid Crystal Titan. It's um, the largest 3D printer that we've ever made. And as far as we know, it's the largest top-down um, resin melt LCD 3D printer ever made. Uh, it's using a 32-inch panel. So, well, I can't remember off the top of my head, 700 by something, with a 1.2 meter build pipe. So uh, that's nearly yeah. two magmas worth of build foot. Right? I think it's about that. Yeah, it's, it's quite a lot. So everything gets bigger, all the problems that Magna deals with get yeah. harder with this. So we've still got blow peel um, peeling about this size. It does take longer, it does take more effort, but that's what lets us print these big accurate objects. Um, we've got the same sort of leveling setup. We've got vat filling because, you know, I think we've said before, emptying a five liter bottle into Magna fills it up. This gets yeah. you to the minimum fill level, roughly five liters. Um, and when your prints are running into the uh, tens of hours, days even, um, not having to come in over the weekend and fill it up is obviously by Absolutely. Cool. Same with emptying. When the bat's bigger, mag magnum, you can squeegee out yourself this, uh, no, you clean it in a sense um, So yeah. It solves one of the big problems that you have when you're through, when you're resin printing this size, which is that if you said, if you were halfway through, if you were halfway through printing and you needed to fill the vat, you're going to get a real temperature shock by suddenly introducing fresh resin into the build chamber. So by being able to siphon it in as and when it needs to, you're reducing that temperature shock and you're keeping a consistent temperature across the whole fill plate and across the whole vat so that you're able to keep these consistent parts. Something this size in resin is insane. So are you still doing 0.05 layer height? So does this go up to a higher layer height at that point? So uh, this works at 250 micron layers. Right. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, daylight lets us do. So because when we get to the screens this big, you can't get the monochrome screens that you can get on smaller 3D yeah. printers because it's just us doing this. So there's no uh, market impetus to get us to that point. So the daylight lets us one, get through those screens uh with the color filter still on yeah but it also lets us go deeper on the layers and with a heavier pigment load so a lot of the end use parts they like the two black or the sanded and painted and so on this lets us do it but if you're printing at 50 micron 100 microns your build time is going to be crazy yeah but um we can print six or seven of these on a platform obviously that's about half of the build height we've got but it's a really nice demo part um almost one torso or close one torso but um, yeah, there's lots of potential applications that we open with parts this big. So we're doing a lot with automotive, a lot with um, robotics, automation, that sort of thing, where they're not making enough of them for an injection mold tool to make sense, but this fills the gap really nicely. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about this sort of gyroid infill that you've got going on. Because again, I'm yeah. assuming there's a lot of extra challenges that suddenly yeah. come along when you start talking about printing at this sort of scale and in this sort of size. Yeah, so uh, this is, a collection of things we're using in a, a package we're calling Weave. So it's our design for large format uh, additive system. So when you print with resin, any free radical resin, so that's all the resins we've got in UV or daylight curing, shrinkage is part of the curing process. Yep. So that might be, pluck a number out of the air, half a percent, let's say one percent in an extreme case. If you're printing a miniature or a little figurine or something on a you know five or six inch printer, one percent is unlikely to cause problems and yeah. if you're doing a box or something really flat you get up to sort of magna and ofa size and it's maybe a hand size object which is where a lot of the industrial use of this type of technology is that starts to cause a problem but normally you can just compensate the size of the model when you're at this point and you have a meter high part one percent is 10 millimeters centimeter shrinkage that starts to cause real issues yeah so what we do with this one of the main techniques there's a whole bunch of them no time to go into it all but um, adding a lattice liner with a thin outer skin uh, basically helps us spread the stresses out during printing. It helps us control the geometry of the part during curing so it doesn't bend out of shape. And it lets us actually wash and cure all of this. Right. It's not the same as infill on an FDM machine because with resin, as I'm sure you guys know, yeah. you've got a big model, you hollow it out, you have to get in there and you have to cure it. So by doing it this way, we're able to wash and cure, we're able to keep the minimum, sorry, the maximum wall thickness really low. Yeah. And we can avoid things like cupping and blowout by making ribs for us. 
we can put more material where it's needed, taking advantage of all the extra things we can do because we're not constrained by a mold. Absolutely, and it's one of the main things that prototyping suffers from when you're trying to do racing printing. It's that you need high dimensional accuracy, but you need volume, and you don't want to you don't want to suddenly cut this up into a bunch of cuboids so that you can then fit that onto a smaller machine because it completely ruins the yeah. the sort of the, the whole point of doing something this scale, which is to yeah, test absolutely. to make sure that it's fit for application. Yeah, so the applications we're looking at are not just in the testing realm. There's a lot of filling in the gap between a larger production method, lots of pilot runs. So if they need a hundred. That's a really nice application for this. If you need raw, then it can even be competitive then as well. Yeah. Depending on the traditional manufacturing technique comparison. So it's astonishing really, because if you go, so, I mean, normal FDM printing, you would do a 0.2 layer height. Yeah. But if you wanted to do something large, obviously you'd be going up for a one millimeter nozzle, or two yeah. millimeter nozzle, something like that. And you have to really sacrifice a lot of things with that. You've compromised a lot of the mechanical properties, yeah. but you also get an appalling surface finish that you then have to figure out how you're going to sort out. Yeah. And yet you've gone, you've gone nearly 10 times, or no, I suppose five times. So 250 micron is 0.25 millimeters. So it's about the same as, what to us is a very thick layer. Yeah, it's I think it's about thick. normal on SCM because we can go up to about 350 with some resins. Right, a 0.35. Um, which is why I use a lamp and printer at home, yeah. to be honest. But um, you do start to run into issues with that because you're having to get photons, get light through this stuff. This reacting with the yeah, so it's just a different set of problems. And then, as you say, that that the fact that it doesn't shrink uniform means that you get a pull there and a push there, yeah. and all of a sudden, what you've got yep. isn't a prototyped part anymore. It's and a, it's not it's, it's the waste of resin. It's a big it's yeah. a big waste of resin, Absolutely. and it doesn't really serve its purpose. That's it. So that's brilliant. Right, as you can see, we're back from Photocentric. This is a few days later. The car is now together, it's one piece. Um, you'll be able to see that we've run a lot of the cabling as well. That's because each part of this, so there was one, two, three, four, five parts of this, six including the bonnet. Um, luckily we realized before we put it together, the wiring channels run through the chassis on this, so they're hidden. Uh, we realised that we need to run them cables before we glue it all together because once it was together, running them would be near enough impossible. So first of all, we ran all the cables through all the separate parts. In the back here, underneath there, like underneath behind the back door, there's a little compartment where the battery pack will go. All the cables are run. We then glued it all together. As you can see, there's been a fair bit of sanding done on this already. So on the roof, there was three join lines, one across the back and then one now and one now. We, when we glued this together, we injected resin into the gaps, sanded it, and then any little low spots, I used filler and sanded it. The roof now is lovely and smooth. So when this gets primed and then painted, you're not gonna be able to see any of these join lines at all. It's gonna look really good. You'll see on the side there, I've already began sanding all that side of the car. This side is unsanded. I've been working on that side. Once I've got that to where I want it, I'll start on this side. So, you know, it's moving along. It's a lot of sanding, it's a lot of dust, but it is getting now. Hopefully, once I finish all the sanding on this and the sanding on the doors, we'll then put it into prime and then it's paint. So, moving along moving along quickly thanks for joining us we'll see you on the next video thanks a lot bye